Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to be looking at cube maps. In some videos, I explicitly go through line by line and type everything out, but this is not going to be one of those videos. We'll simply have too many moving parts, and a lot of it will be shuffling around uniforms, which is not fun. What we'll be doing is we'll be talking about the concept of cube maps, how they work, how we can work with them, and then we'll be talking about how we're using them in the engine. Then I'll go ahead and look at the code and go into some of the details. So a cube map is what you imagine. It's a cube. If we were to take a cube and flatten it out, we could produce a net just like this. Now in GPU storage in OpenGL, we don't use a net, but a net is a good way of visualizing a cube map. Here's sort of how the GPU sees it. So the GPU sees a series of six images, six textures, each associated with a cardinal direction. We specify all of that upon loading the images. Now, the way we sample from a cube map is if we imagine a unit length cube, so length equals width equals height equals one, centered around the origin, and then we imagine some direction emanating from the origin, that direction would trace outwards and hit the cube on one of these images at a certain position. That is the color value which is sampled, which is returned. So if I'm getting this right, I'll double check this later, but in the shader, this uniform type is called a sampler text, uh, sorry, sampler cube. And then we use the same texture function to actually sample that. So the first argument is the sampler that we wanna look at. And the second argument is some sort of direction. That direction has to be a VEC3, but it does not need to be normalized. It's totally fine. Okay, so there's that. But then the next question is, alrighty, how do we draw the sky? So imagine that we've got a sky map, a cube map of some sort, and we've split it up into six images. These six images all need to be the same size, by the way. Then we've loaded that into our shader, and now we have some sort of scenario. So let's say that we have a coordinate system like this, and the camera is at the coordinate system and it has some sort of orientation. So it's looking in some sort of direction. And remember, let me make, make this a little bigger just to make it easier to read. Remember that the camera has fundamental vectors. So this is its forwards vector. Let's say this is its right vector and this is its up vector. Okay. Now the camera is looking at the screen. So on the screen, we sort of see this. But if we were to put this into world space, it would be oriented something like this. You know, it's out there. We're looking at it. So then the question is, for any given pixel on the screen, how does that pixel relate to the camera's direction? So for instance, what's the vector that I would have to look in to see this pixel here, right in the center of the screen? Hopefully you can see that this pixel here corresponds just to the camera's forwards vector. Now this pixel here on the other hand, the way we would get there is we take the vector sum of the camera's forwards vector and its right vector. Okay, so I can say that's forwards plus right. And just note that this is the far right side of the screen. So the X coordinate here is one. Then if we were to look at this point here on the left, that is the mirror opposite of that. So that would be the forwards vector minus the right vector, we'll go the other way. And note here, we have an X coordinate of negative one. So up here, we have a coordinate of forwards plus the up vector. If we look at the up vector and add that, gets us to the top. Here we have a Y value of one. Here we have forwards minus the up vector, and that's a Y value of negative one. And hopefully you can see where I'm going with, where I'm going here. So for any random position on a quad on the screen, 
that will have coordinates x and y. We don't know what they are, but they're somewhere on here. And the vector going through that will be the camera's forwards vector plus the x coordinate times the camera's right vector plus the y coordinate times the camera's up vector. Now I want you to take some time to think about that. I know that it's a little strange. It's a bit of a, an esoteric concept, maybe, but it's, it's really important to be solid with that. So if I wanna draw the screen, what I basically do is draw a quad that covers the whole screen and then pass in the camera's fundamental vectors as uniforms. And then for every position on that quad, I can calculate the direction that should be going through it. And then I pass that along to the, to the fragment shader. Okay, so here is an overview of my, I'm going to call this my sky shader. So the sky shader will have two, two modules. What we want to do is in the vertex module, we want to calculate the ray direction. So the direction that's passing from the origin through that point on the screen, and that will be used by the fragment shader in order to sample, to sample that, um, to sample that cube map. So if we think about the data flowing along, this attribute will be out, this attribute will be in. Clearly the, the purpose of this is to output a color. So you have an out attribute, color. Then we've got some uniforms. So we're gonna pass in the camera's forwards, right and up vector in every frame. That will be handled by the camera system by the camera system's update function. It goes ahead, it sets the camera. By the way, it also passes along its fundamental vectors to the sky shader. And then of course, in the fragment shader, we're also gonna need the sky, that, uh, that cube map texture. We're gonna need that as a uniform as well. And that will be set by the render system in its update. Okay, so there's that. And then as well as that, what we can do is we can use the sky in our other shaders. Because if I'm looking at an object, say like here's the world out here somewhere, here's the ground, I'm looking at this object here. My camera has some position, so there's some direction vector from the camera to the object. And the camera, uh, the object has some sort of normal. So we can actually rebound off that normal and then sample the sky. So we actually get sky reflections on everything in our scene. And so let me pop over to the standard shader. I'll say that. I actually find these diagrams really useful just analyzing things in general. Okay, so our vertex shader takes in three attributes, position, text coordinate, and normal, and it outputs three attributes. Yep, so these are the out attributes of the vertex shader, and they match with the in attributes of the fragment shader. Okay, now in addition to that, the vertex shader has some models, uh, uniforms I mean. Now on the fragment shader side, likewise we're going to be writing out to the color buffer, but we're also going to have some uniforms. So we'll have the image array that we've been using before to render all of our basic objects. So that's a texture. Uh, we also have a cube map here, the sky. It's actually going to be the same cube map as the same cube map as in the sky shader. And we also need to know in order to get the rebounds, we need to know where the camera is positioned at. So this is another attribute a uniform, which will be set by the camera system. Okay. So hopefully you can see sort of the flow of data and hopefully you can see that this is a little, a little tedious to set up line by line, but this is the big picture. 
Now, even more important is how do we get these things working together? So we are not working with one pipeline anymore. We're actually working with multiple pipelines. So what we do is the first thing I'm going to do is draw the sky. And then I'm going to draw the geometry. And then I'm going to draw everything else. So I'm just going to say standard, like all the, the objects, the 3D objects. Alrighty. So when we go to draw the sky, the first thing I'm going to do is turn depth testing off. And the reason for that is that I'm going to be drawing the sky right at the eye level. So basically in front of everything. And I don't want to overwrite the depth data. I don't want this to interfere with anything else that I draw. So just disable depth testing. And then I'm going to bind the cube map. And I'm going to bind this to texture unit one. Okay. Then I go ahead and draw the sky. Then before I draw the geometry, I turn depth testing on. I bind my um, image array. And that will be bound to texture unit zero. So we will have both the sky and the image array available. And then I will go ahead and bind my vertex array object for my geometry data. Okay, so go ahead and draw that. Then before I do the rest of my drawing, I bind my image array, and that's the image array holding all the, the model textures and things, not the geometry textures. Again, that will be unit zero. And then I bind my VAO, which holds all of my model vertex data. And then I go ahead and, and draw objects and things. Okay, so hopefully this wasn't too heavy of an explanation and it sort of ties everything together. Now let's have a look at the code. All right, so here we are in the code. Of course, as always, it's linked down below. Strongly recommend that you open this up and have a play around with it. So <clears throat> I'll just go down to the factories and this is where it begins. So go to the texture factory and in the texture factory, I have this build cube map. This is completely, completely self-contained. It's not like the other factory methods where you start doing something and then work on it bit by bit. No, with the, yeah, with the cube map, it's just all in one. All right, so if I look at this image file, I have this, you know, th this sky, oops, sky images that I want to load in one by one. And the way this cube map function works is we have a list of file names, a vector of file names. So the first thing we do is we generate a texture. We bind that as the cube map texture that we're going to work on, allocate some storage there. All of these images are going to be 1024 by 1024 pixels. Okay. And then we go through each of those six file names. For each of those six file names, we load the image with SDBI, and then we set a sub image. Now the way we specify which of these we're going to be loading in, the convention is to start with um, cube map positive X, and then it goes positive X to negative X to positive Y, negative Y, positive Z, negative Z. But the way these constants are arranged, we can get to the next constant by adding a number. So if I go positive X plus one, that's negative X. If I go positive X plus two, that is positive Y and so on. So that's what I'm doing with this plus I. So once that loop completes, all six images will be loaded in and in place in the cube map. No problem. So then if I go to the camera system, Actually, let me just go to the app first, just to refresh the way this works. Okay. So when we run this, we go through each of these systems, the camera system updates, and then down below the render system updates. So when the camera system updates, it sends all the data that it needs to about the camera to the appropriate shader. We can see that in the camera system 
down here. So here the camera system, this is a little messy, isn't it? I might need to look at this, but that's okay. So first of all, yeah, so shaders zero will be the sky shader. So we activate that and we send in the cameras forwards, right and up vectors. This DX and DY are basically correction factors to correct for the aspect ratio of the screen. I'll leave that for you to look into, but basically I just tweak these numbers until it looked right. And yeah, I mean, that's it. We're just sending the fundamental vectors. So then when we go to the render system, in the render system, these are all the file names, by the way. When we go down to the update function to draw the sky, there we go. Use our sky shader, disable the depth test, bind the sky texture and draw. And that's it. I'm not even binding a VAO because in my shader for my sky, I'm actually hard coding those positions as a constant vector in here. So I've, I've probably said all I should say for now. I'll give this a go. There we go. Now, as you can see, the sky is there. It's, uh, it's bound pretty nicely. So again, I'll go through that. First of all, we draw the sky. And then on top of that, we draw everything else. And we make sure we're drawing on top because we disabled the depth test before we draw all the other objects. Okay, so that's well and good. But the next thing we can do is go ahead and draw the reflections as well. So I'll just give this a go first. So now we can see for each of these objects, they have also got a reflection of the sky. And this is really clear if I go up close to Revy, hard to see maybe, but yeah, the surface is reflecting the sky. I mean, we can see this everywhere, can't we? If I go right back, anyway, everything reflecting the sky. Excellent. So then how do we accomplish this? Well, let me just close this down. We'll have a look at that. Yeah. So let's have a look at the yeah, the fragment shader, for instance, this will all work the same way. So we get all of the data in before that we normally had, plus we're also taking in the, um, the camera's position. Now, the reason we need the camera's position is if we take the fragment position in world space that we're drawing, subtract the camera's position, then we get a direction vector, which is the incident. That's the direction vector from the camera looking at the thing we're drawing incoming. Then we can use G, um, GLSL's reflect function to reflect this around the normal, and that will give us the reflected direction. The reflected direction we can then use to sample something from the sky. And I've also got this diffuse, which is just looking out in the direction of the normal. So yeah, there we have it. I think that'll be it for now. I hope all of that made sense. And yeah, all the best. As always, have fun. I'll see you again soon. Bye.